Hi, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Monday morning uh, grand rounds. Um, I want to take a moment first to thank our uh, sponsor, Janssen Pharmaceuticals, for uh, their continued support of our grand rounds. This morning, um, we have a really wonderful speaker. Uh, I've, over my career, it's been my privilege to work with and learn from Dr. Mike Cummings, <laughs> who, as many of you know, is the co-director of the Abbott Northwestern General Medical Associates. And um, they, that's faculty, they serve as faculty for a really spectacular internal medicine program. And um, you know, along the way, Mike has developed an interest in critical thinking, and I've learned, uh, that's where I've learned most from Mike. Uh, he's taught the residents how to look at the medical literature and with a critical eye. He's been instrumental in, in practical evaluation of preoperative testing, appropriate testing, and in treatment of hypertension. Last month, um, Alex Campbell and I attended a grand rounds that Mike gave for internal medicine. It was in this room, it was packed, and we all left with, a, with great uh, admiration for his presentation. And with that, we invited him to uh, come here before our audience. So this morning, we are really, really privileged to have Dr. Mike coming. Thank you, Scott. I'm a little humbled right now because Scott, Scott is one of my heroes. So this morning, you're going to hear a lot of quotes, and, and we're going to start out with a quote. It comes from one of my intellectual heroes, Montaigne, and he said, it is good to rub and polish our brain against others. And he said, I quote others and only in, in order to better express myself. Patrick Moynihan, the late senator from New York, said, you are entitled to your own opinion, but you are not entitled to your own facts. Mm -hmm. And the more I think about this quote, it becomes even somewhat problematic because of what are the facts? Goethe said, every man hears only what he understands. Right? So that can explain sometimes why we don't under, agree about the facts. So nowadays you hear people say, I believe in science, right? And you have other folks that say, I do my own research. What does that mean, right? So I think uh, science is in the dock right now. By that, I mean that uh, mistrust of science has maybe never been higher. And how did this happen? There's a great book written by Jonathan Rauch called The Constitution of Knowledge. And he goes on a lot of things that happened the last few years to, to result in this sort of distrust of science. And I recommend this book to everybody, but that's not really the purpose of, of my talk today on how this mistrust of science happened. Rather, to say that we played a little bit of a role in this, not just a flat earth society. Right, not just all these terrible people on the internet. But is it possible that we had a small role in this undermining of science? So I'm gonna do a little segue. Uh, there's a great movie called Citizen Kane. And I'm just gonna go through, over a little bit for people who aren't familiar with it. But it begins in the bedroom of this mansion called Xanadu, where this giant media mogul, Charles Foster Kane, He's on his deathbed and he's holding a snow globe in his hand. And he utters the word rosebud just as he dies and it falls on and breaks on the floor. And this, then it's followed by this newsreel obituary that chronicles, chronicles the life of Cain. And, and um, what's interesting, if you watch the newsreel, it has all his highlights, but in the background, it's, it's what's going on in the world. And this is the 30s. And you realize things have, are maybe even. Things have always been difficult, I guess, right? Let's put it this way. They were, they were contesting elections back then too as well. So a lot of things that we think are new were going on in the 30s and you had the rise of Nazism. So that's the background for his, his life. But uh, the, the editor was curious about his dying words, Rosebud. So he signs a reporter to find out what it meant. 
And then what, in, the, in the course of that, you get an investigation to Kane's life, all right? And it consists in these interviews of all the people who knew Kane, right? And you never see the interview, by the way, you just see his back and then, and then the people he talks to, okay? But you find out that our lives survive only in the memories of others. So everybody has a unique view of Cain, right? There's no one version that's believable. Is he this maniac or is he this brilliant journalist, right? And then Mr. Thompson says, I don't think any word can explain a man's life. No, I guess Rosebud is just a piece in a jigsaw puzzle because they find out what it means. It just turns out it was the name of the sled he had as a boy. And yet the puzzle's still there. Who really was this Cain? And I think it's the perfect metaphor for today's talk about COVID. Mr. Bernstein, who is a close kind of a, his assistant, a really loyal assistant to Mr. Cain, says, I was there before the beginning, young fella, and now it's after the end. All right. So everyone in this room was there before the beginning of COVID. Right. Everyone here was an eyewitness, and some of you were actually participants giving treatments or advice, right? And yet everyone here is, perceives the world through separate modes of experience, in the words of Michael Oakeshott, right? So we all have our own unique perspective. And the purpose of my talk this morning is not to persuade you that my version is the correct one, but rather to convince you that some of the questions and issues raised today are real and worth pondering. There's a, there's a Cistercian monk from Australia who says, it is the thinking and reflection that are important, not the arrival of some conclusion. I think that's kind of good to keep that in the back of our head on a lot of things we discuss today. So the title of today's talk is called Searching for the Truth in a Post-Truth Era. So Aristotle said there is no desire more natural than the desire for knowledge. And I think we all can relate that. That's why we're, we have the professions that we have. We're interested in learning, right? But Montaigne, my intellectual hero, says knowledge is an excellent drug. But no drug has virtue enough to preserve itself from corruption and decay if the vessel be tainted and impure where it's put to keep, all right? So who is this guy, Montaigne? He was a 16th century nobleman, magistrate and wine grower. And he lived during a time where there was these bloody religious civil wars. We're not having bloody wars and not necessarily religious, but we certainly have a lot of cultural wars, right? So it's not that dissimilar. At the age of 38, he retired from public life to, to the tower of his estate. And there he had over a thousand books and on, he, he had these quotations put on the roof beams of his, of his library. And one, and one of them says, only one thing is certain, that nothing is certain from Pliny the Elder. So he was up there about a year or two and he started to get a little bit depressed, a little bit bored. So he started to write and he wrote, wrote in the, the first person. And he's really the first writer that we know about that would really write about himself in the first person that we have on record, okay? And he said, and quote, I am myself the subject of my book. When the process of doing this writing, he basically invented the modern essay. If you go back and read his uh, essays, you'll just, they're incredibly insightful. And he always used to ask himself, what do I know? What do I really know? He would investigate whatever topic he would he'd look at it from all these different perspectives. When, and once you think, oh, that's right, then he'd have to give you another perspective. And he felt that the search for knowledge begins with from knowledge of oneself. So if all of us want to get to the truth, we need to examine ourselves first. And he said, from that, all knowledge flows. And he said, if others examine themselves as attentively as I do, they would find themselves as I do, full of inanity and nonsense. Inanity and nonsense. He said, get rid of it, I cannot without getting rid of myself. 
we are all steeped in it, one as much as the other, right? But those who are aware of it are a little better off. And I think he's right, but then he puts, does another quick Montaigne on you, though I don't know, right? So once, maybe we're not better off, but I think we are, right? So the question for us is what do we know, right? What do we really know? You name the topic, what do we really know about heart failure? What don't we know, right? Is salt good or bad, right? So Michael Oakeshott, the English philosopher said, thought must have a starting place. It can have none better than a good definition. A good definition centers the mind. I really love this quote. So let's get some definitions so we can center our minds. So what is science? And I'd like to distinguish today, this morning, between the philosophy of science and the institution of science. So philosophy of science, let me give you some quotes. Carl Sagan, I think everyone in this room, unfortunately, is old enough to know who he is. When I gave grand rounds to the residents, I don't think they knew who he was, right? It's depressing. He said, science is more than a body of knowledge, it is a way of thinking, a way of skeptically interrogating the universe with a fine understanding of human fallibility. I like the way you put that human fallibility in there, right? And Michael Oakeshott says, by the scientific method, we gradually build up our knowledge. This is really good. And advance from less true to more true. Oh, Richard Feynman, arguably the greatest physicist of the second half of the 20th century said, science Get this, I had to read this for, uh, over and over, is the belief in the ignorance of, of experts. Counterintuitive, right? What's he talking about? He said, when someone says science teaches such and such, he is using the word incorrectly. By the way, how many times have you heard that in the last two and a half years? You might ask, how does science show it? How does the scientist find out how, what, where? It should not be science has shown, but this experiment, this effect has shown. But we do this all the time. And you have as much right as anyone else upon hearing the experiments, but be patient and listen to all the evidence to judge whether a sensible conclusion has been arrived at. The experts who are leading you may be wrong. This is maybe our greatest physicist of the second half of the 20th century. Pick this up, a, a woman physician wrote this to a New England Journal a couple of years ago. Says, she said, what makes science right is the enduring capacity to admit we are wrong. But you haven't heard many people admit they were wrong lately. Okay, so let's talk about the institution of science. It's filled with experts and we're kind of part of that institution, people in this room, and we communicate with each other through journals and conferences, and, that's, and then through conferences, we kind of communicate with the public, right? But what we're doing is we're interpreting evidence, we're making recommendations, and we're setting policies, or for physicians, we're treating somebody based on the evidence, right? But we're making subjective judgments. And I think it's an important thing to remember, every time we, we're taking something that's sort of the facts, now we're going to interpret it. We're now making subjective judgments. And I think COVID-19 has thrown into sharp relief the distinction between science as a philosophy and science as an institution. We conflated them, right? And there's a, Mike, uh, Matt Ridley is a, is a scientist who's now become a scientific journalist who's actually a true journalist. And he said there's a tension between experts wanting to present a unified and authoritative voice while simultaneously remaining open-minded and prepared to change his mind, right? That's the tension we have, okay? Then throw in a deadly novel virus that mutates the unpredictability of human error and then the evolving uh, immunity that we all developed, right? So, so no wonder we're gonna be wrong and make mistakes. So, we're in the dock, right? Mistrust is high. 
So Schopenhauer, the philosopher said, objectivity is genius. I just think about that for a second. Michael Casey, the monk says, below the level of consciousness, we are influenced by prejudice and ideology. Everyone in this room brings that baggage and that's why we're not geniuses, right? And I'm gonna give you three biases. That's sort of the newest thing is biases, but I'm gonna give you three ones that I think cloud our ability to be objective. And I think we're hopefully if we're aware of it, we might be slightly more objective. The last time I checked, there was 120 different biases out there, which is sort of ridiculous, right? But I, I, I came up with three that I think are important. The bias towards self. The theologian John Henry Newman said, human knowledge and human reason alone will never contend against those giants, the passion and the pride of man. Okay, anyone who who's works with people or is a physician who takes care of human beings, you realize, oh my gosh, we all have our blind spots, right? I can be taking care of the smartest patient in the world and it's like, oh, right? We all, or anytime you go to a family meeting, right? Passion, how rational are we, right? Confirmation bias. If there's anyone in the world who understands confirmation bias, it's Jeff Bezos. He's now the second richest man in the world. Think of all those algorithms. You're, they're nothing but confirmation bias. So you'll read what you, you'll buy and read what you like. They're, they're, they're doing that on the background, right? So Francis Bacon, who's the father of empiricism, who, should, who knows best about the, trying to be objective said, the human understanding when it was once adopted opinion draws all things to support and agree with it. And that's what confirmation bias is. And that's what Bezos understood better than any human being, right? Barzin, the intellectual historian said, this is really good. History demonstrates how easily trained minds ignore unwelcome facts. We all do that. And then you look back, oh, it was right there in front of you, but you didn't want to recognize it. Michael Casey says, we see, only what we expect to see. So he's even to take it to another level. So Mike Tyson, everyone in this room might know who Mike Tyson is, fortunately, but he was considered this, uh, the toughest boxing heavyweight champion of all time. No one would ever touch him. Everyone was afraid of him, other boxers. He was indestructible. Well, in 1990, he fought a guy named Buster Douglas, and it was a 43 to one odds, which are astronomical, that, that, that Tyson would win. So everyone knew that Tyson would win. And this writer went back and watched the whole tape of his fight. And, he, and he, first of all, he paid attention to the announcers. The announcers were all experts, right? They knew more about boxing than anyone in this room. But they're, they knew that Mike Tyson was gonna win. So as you listen to him, call the fight, they're not even recognizing that Mike Tyson is losing. Everything that Mike Tyson has a reason. D D Douglas is just lucky. So they missed the whole fight right in front of their eyes. And then he went and looked at the scorecard. And the scorecard was much closer to the fight than it actually happened. So they, he had the fight very, the, the scorekeepers who are experts, three judges, had the fight being very close, even though clearly Buster Douglas was winning. Right. And so Michael Casey says our preemptive interpretations distort the evidence so that everything we, we perceive conf confirms our in anticipations. So they were looking to find what they wanted to see and they missed it right in front of their own eyes. And the take home message for us is these are experts. Right. So conformity bias, the, second, the third bias, otherwise known as tribalism. Right, scientists aren't tribalists, are they? So Jonathan Rauch, the one I, the constitutional knowledge author says, cognition is influenced not only by our biases, but also by the bias of others we identify with, right? Our team, other doctors. Jonathan Haidt said, our, our minds unite us into teams. 
divide us against other teams and so blind us to truth. So it's not just the Vikings and Packer fans. We all have our own community where we are together, right? And there's someone else out there, the enemy. So Rausch asked this really interesting question. What happens when individual biases, especially confirmation bias, interact with the group dynamics of conformity, right? So you wanna be part of this group and you have, you're bringing your own bias to that. And what happens is you get behavior which is rewarding for individuals, but self-defeating for the communities, meaning that if I'm in this group, if I want to get it promoted within the line, I got to say the party line, right? Then, so it's good for me. But if 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 the if a line is not hearing a dissenting view or another discussion or another perspective, that group is losing out. You can see it in your own discussions in your own group, right? You, you, you just you don't want to say too much, right? Because then you'll lose credibility. You'll never be asked to be on a committee. So there's a potential that when when these two things come together, we're not getting to the truth. And you can see how this happened. I use this example, but I, I think with Putin and the generals, right? If the generals disagreed with Putin's idea to, to invade Ukraine, it would not have been their self-interest to say that, right? And so they're just gonna say, let's do it. Now that's obviously an, uh, kind of a dramatic example, but you can see how that happens. So St. Jerome said, things are understood by their opposite. Sometimes I think it's hard to explain how to do something, but if you see how it's done incorrectly, maybe that can give us insights. So I'm gonna, so I'm gonna give you, I hesitate to do this, but I'm gonna give you uh, three errors that I think we made as experts. And I wanna see if you can see bias towards self in these examples or confirmation bias or conformity bias in these three examples. And I call these unforced errors like in a football game, it's not when another team makes you do it, you just do it to yourself. Models. John Lesser asked me what got me interested in this topic. It was my frustration with models, if I'm really going to be honest with you. So I just went back and reviewed what models really should be. And this is very powerful, I think. Remember, models is sort of a simplified view of the world. That's what it is, but I, definitions, right? Let's center the mind. That it's a simplified view of the world. And statistical modeling combines data with assumptions to yield a quantitative result that's a function of, I emphasize both, right? So it's data plus your assumptions, okay? And this is important. And when reporting and interpreting a model, clearly state your assumptions, rarely saw that done, and discuss the extent they are known or not known to be plausible. Okay. And then address the reliability of the data, okay? Put that in your head. That's really what we should be doing when we're doing models. All right, this is from, Alina, this is the first year of COVID, and we're trying to predict ICU admissions. Okay, so all that blue is what we were predicting, and the red is what happened, and that's over one year. Okay, so John, right about here, I started to lose my mind. <laughs> okay. So well, next topic is origin of COVID-19. I want to declare that I'm agnostic on the origin of COVID-19. I don't know enough to have an opinion, to be honest. But this is from Lancet. And these are direct quotes from 27 public scientists on March 7th, 2020. The rapid, open, and transparent sharing of data on this outbreak is now being threatened by rumors and misinformation about the origins of COVID-19. We stand together to strongly condemn conspiracy theories suggesting that COVID-19 does not have a natural origin, okay? This is direct. We stand together, conspiracy theories. A year later, 
the same group wrote, a, wrote another letter and notice how the language changes. It took them a year. The intent of our original correspondence was to express a working view. Now it's a working view. Before it was sort of like we know, right? That SARS-CoV-19 most likely originated in nature and, and not in an elaborate on the basis of blah, blah, blah. Right? Well, it's been a year. Okay. Based on new, credible, and peer-reviewed evidence, we believe that the virus evolved in nature. Suggestions of the laboratory leak remain without scientifically validated evidence. Okay. So they softened it. Another group of experts who disagree with this conclusion wrote a letter later that fall, and they titled it an appeal for an objective, open, and transparent scientific debate about the origin of SARS COVID-2. So they're just saying, let's have a debate. And in it, they do this. There is no direct support for the natural origin of SARS-2 and a laboratory related accident is plausible, right? So there really wasn't any direct evidence. Doesn't mean they're not right, but it, it wasn't direct, it was inferential. Immunity. Once again, I'm agnostic on this, but I went to the CDC website and these are direct quotes. This was the title of their, what they put up on August 6, 2021, new CDC study. I want you to read this. Vaccination offers higher protection than previous COVID-19 infection. So they're telling us that if you get vaccinated, that's better than having an infection, right? I, I went to everyone in my group and said, what does that mean? That's, we all had the same conclusion. I want to make sure I wasn't missing something. But then you look at the study, it, was, it involved Kentucky residents who had previously been infected. And then they, and they found out that if you were unvaccinated, you were 2.3 more times more likely to be reinfected than vaccinated. So that if you've been exposed and you were also get vaccinated, you're less likely to get it again. Well, that's good. That makes sense. It's a reason to get vaccinated, but that's not what the title is at all. You're not comparing those two things. This is the CDC. So this was not a head-to-head -head comparison. So where do we go from here? So I, I came up with three things. Number one, critical appraisal matters. Distinctions matter. And finally, everybody matters. I think I'm gonna finish a little ahead of time. But that's good because I hope we can have a conversation following this. Let's talk about critical appraisal. There is no such thing as the perfect paper. This comes from Dr. Anthony Daniels. There is no such thing as the perfect paper that, ex that omits nothing, answers all questions, and cannot be criticized on any ground. I think we all can agree with that, right? So the process and quality of critical appraisal matters. And I guess that's probably the thing I'm most passionate about in teaching medical residents. And I think that nothing's done more to obscure a critical thinking than, under, than P values and receiver operating. Like that answers the questions, right? Risk and uncertainty will never be removed from anything we do. I think we've got to remember that. So one of the things I like is table one, right? I think it's the most important thing of any study. Who is in the study and who isn't? And we forget that every time and then what we next thing we're doing, we're extrapolating it to everyone with CHF, right? This was a small group, this age group in the hospital, right? Well, in, in uh, Paxlovid, which uh, is the treatment of choice now, was, was studied, what was table one for Paxlovid? unvaccinated people with a different variant, right? It still might be the right thing to do, but it's inferential now, isn't it? And people can just decide whether it makes sense. So table one, endpoints is another thing that drives me crazy. Surrogate endpoints. Is IgG level really the same thing as ending up in the hospital with COVID on a ventilator? 
Turns out it isn't. Composite endpoints. In all my teaching uh, of medical residents and students who all got uh, A's in, in probability and statistics in the medical review of the literature, I'm sure, none of them knew the criteria for composite endpoints. And that is they should all be of, of equal importance. And they never are. They should all be of equal frequency and they never are. And the, 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 the treatment should work equally well in all three. Yeah. Study design. Um, you know, we acted like models are, are, are sort of the same thing as an RCT. Observational studies, when we're making a recommendation based on an observational study, we should say we're making a recommendation based on an observational study not, and not say it's the same thing as an RCT. We did that all the time. Okay. Someone once said he likes observational studies, but the problem is he never knows which ones are right. <laughs> uh, words matter. This is a new addition to the talk. It was this, this, this comes from a letter that was just in this week's Lancet from Howard Bauchner, Bauchner who I think was the former editor of, of JAMA. And it's titled, The Scientific Communication Ecosystem, The Responsibility of Investigators. And I'm gonna, I joked to all my colleagues at work, I said I was weeping when I read this article. And I have copies here if people are interested. And it's, I recommend everyone in this audience, particularly those who do research, read this. And in this uh, opinion piece, he says, he writes, uh, he, said, he tells us to choose our words carefully. And he says, statements and adjectives that reflect extremes should be avoided. And you saw that letter to the editor from the, our scientists, right? In Lancet, there was a lot of extreme words in that one, right? And there was a study that looked at the 900 abstracts that were written between 1985 and 2020 to get funding from uh, NIOSH, okay, or, and in those going from 1985 to 2020, there was a 1,375% increase in the words novel, innovative, and transformative. And these are scientists trying to get money from the government, right? And I would say in medicine, at most, there's a handful of studies each year that really change what we do. It, you know, the growth, it's slow, it's real, but it's slow. And then they, another study looked at 460 press releases that accompanied the release of the, of the paper. And they found that 40% exaggerated the advice. Now, this is, this is not the press, this is us, right? This is our press release. And 33% sort of fudge causal claims, right? We always think association is causal. Distinctions matter. I've added two commandments to the Ten Commandments today, by the way. So, thou shall not conflate scientific debate with policy debate. Once the evidence has been clearly established, let's say we have a good RCT and we're pretty, we're getting to more true now, and we believe it. This is the point at which the political discussion or the policy debate should begins. It doesn't end. We got a bat, you know, that now we can talk about it. Michael Oakshot says the benefits of the proposal are weighed against the resulting disturbance. So yes, this is the, the, there's something here that's that's that we can act upon, but let's now what's what's going to be the disturbance because of this, and then people can disagree. But that's different. That's not a scientific debate. We're conflating the two, and you, you, it's okay to disagree. You should do it in good faith and, and be responsible. Thomas Sowell, the, the, the economist says, there are no solutions, only trade-offs. And I don't think we recognize this at all in, this, in our, all our decisions about COVID. Doesn't mean, I'm not second guessing them, but we should acknowledge the trade-offs. Commandment number 12, thou shall not conflate empirical rationale with precautionary principle. Those are kind of fancy words. 
what I mean by that. Sometimes the evidence is insufficient, right? There is no RCT. It's the beginning of a pandemic. We're worried we're all gonna die. We all felt that, right? And the benefits of the proposal, whatever we're proposing are unclear. Doesn't mean we shouldn't do it. We just have to acknowledge that we're using it as a precautionary principle. We think that there's enough here that this makes sense to do at this time. And if we, if we, if we say we're using a precautionary principle to the audience, to, the, to our population, to our patients, to whatever, we can be more, more free to change our mind. This, we thought this was the right thing to do at this time based on this, but we never said this was science. I think that's what gets us into trouble. Or you can say we're going to science, but it's unclear it may evolve, it may change. Finally, uh, everybody matters. One thing you know about medicine, I think all of us went into, is that at the end of the day, when the door closes or in the old days when the curtain pulled and you were talking to a patient, it didn't matter what that person, what their perspective was, who they were, what socioeconomic class they came from. You tried to meet with them and, 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 and help them in the decisions that they had to make. Some of them may have driven you crazy, but then they always tried to meet them where they were. And I think physicians have a unique perspective on that, I think, that, 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 that public health officials don't, that we really do try to meet people. We're not always good at it, we make mistakes, but I think we all go in with that intention. And so I'd like to close with a quote from an Australian public intellectual named Howard McKay. And I think this is sort of what I mean by everybody matters. Most of us manage to be honest and dishonest. We display integrity and hypocrisy and to confuse our opinions with the truth that makes us look ridiculous to people who interpret the world differently. He says, perhaps the process of accepting that we are the sort of people we truly are, messy, inconsistent, neurotic, as well as noble, earnest, and endearing, we can find a new, more realistic level of respect for ourselves and each other. So that's the talk. And I was just hoping that, because I don't have any answers, but I was hoping that following this talk that people can just tell us what they experienced the past two and a half years. And we can have a conversation where everyone, that's what we tried to do after my grand rounds with the residents and, and the faculty is just, because we've all just lived through this incredible experience and no one really talks about it that much, right? And, and it's impacted our lives in, in a lot of different ways. So I, I'd like to open it up to people's thoughts. You guys remember the the, the, the the day the shutdown began? I do. We're, I got in my car. We have, we're having a, a meeting in our group. We're going to figure out what the heck are we going to do? None of us knew what to do. I remember just driving there. No cars on the road. Right? It was almost like it was an apocalypse. And I get to the room, and all our doctors are there. We're all wearing masks. And we're trying to figure out what we're going to do. And it was such a scary feeling. One of my colleagues said, I don't even know if we'll all be here a year from now. So I think it's good to revisit how we felt and, and then how things changed over the next almost three years now. John? Don't you think the nuance of the conversation with understanding the parameters and the reference points and all of those things are so difficult to communicate to a large audience because they're not trained in the same way? In other words, trained to be right. more objective. Right. And, and then you have to have a conversation where it's a lot easier, and we all do it, to just uh, look at simple things. You know, bad, good, right. evil, not. Right. And, and so this is totally understandable. I don't, I, you know, I don't know how, because it, the time was so important. How, how do you make policy decisions? How do you change people's behavior? when you may be somewhat objective with the evidence with the model being terrible because you have no data versus ideas that are completely unrelated. 
uh, the conspiracy type ideas. Yes. That have, so, so that, and then talk it into a public forum mm -hmm. where there's no nuance. And so, yeah, so you could, in a sense, it's, it's an impossible task, right? And I think we can acknowledge that. But, I, you know, there are some people that are resistant to evidence, right? And there's people who are bad actors. But I, I, I think we still could have been a little bit more transparent and a little more humble. Because I do think hubris is what gets us sometimes. And just, I think, I guess when I was trying, I, I, I know you're right, but the way I challenge a little bit, when you're in the room with a patient, they might not have gone to an elite school, but sometimes they're a little more thoughtful than you think they are. And they understand sometimes risk benefit better than you do, or better than you think they do. I mean, I, because I take care of carpenters from Richfield, and they sometimes have, so I know you're right, but I do think we still could do it with a little more less hubris and say, here, the evidence is pretty clear. You know, we should have nailed the thing about, in my view, about vaccination, say it's pretty darn clear. Now, what you want to do with that is different, but it, th this is strong evidence. But then, when, when then we kind of waited in the other stuff where, where it was observational, it turned out some of it was wrong. You know, we were scolding people saying, if we don't get it, we're going to give it to other people. Well, it turned out, I was, and so I'm just saying, you got it. I do think we could have done a better job, but, but your point is well taken. Not. Oh, that was really a powerful presentation. Thank and you. I always think it's important that we be introspective when we're dealing with what uh, what we don't know and know. But um, you know, as you look back on how the medical uh, journals handled all this, what's your what's your perspective on, let's say, you know, the New England Journal of Medicine and JAMA and even the, the cardiology journals? You know, it, it just it, this became such a uh, overwhelming focus of all these journals that every everything else in medicine sort of got lost <laughs> that you know hypertension and and uh, myocardial infarctions and it's like they became unimportant issues and you know i'm just wondering well, i don't i don't think i have anything unique i just but i, do, I think you there was a huge trade-off there wasn't there that that we we we, we Took our eye off the ball and other things, and so there there was a cost of being obsessed with COVID. I think, and it's easy to say that now. So I I, say, I temper my criticism, but it, and I do I did I thought the editorials were incredibly inflammatory. To be honest with you, for people who should, should have known better, it, why low, why stoop yourself to the flat Earth Society? This, this would be my biggest challenge. Is I I was very disappointed in the editorials. And I'm a fully vaccinated, you know, I believe we landed on the moon, okay? But I was, I, I just, I was very supporting the planetary and, and, and I think that's what I was trying to get is that we, we, we treat people who fundamentally disagree with a lot of their values, but most of them are that there's a core there that they're more human than we want to admit. And even Green Bay Packers. Fans have feelings. It's the same thing. <laughs> so, so in the news, things used to be more seemingly more uh, balanced. And there was more of a general agreement about what people were seeing. I think so. And when you put in this very difficult thing on top of the world changing to tribalism, it's a perfect so you know, a perfect storm, isn't it? The internet didn't help, did it? So how has this changed you when you go as a doctor? Has this made a difference to you? Do you interpret studies differently now? Or after doing all this research, are you are you any different? I, I, it, it sort of reinforced my bias that critical appraisal is just... So I have a I have a bias that sometimes we have too much hubris in, the, in one of our models, don't just stand there, do something. You know, and one of my little things that we know less than we think, so we do more than we should. And you see that in medicine all the time. So it just reinforced my bias that we sometimes just say, you know, we don't know. And I'm at the, so I don't know if that answers your question. So I'm guilty of biases. How does it change you, John? No practice at all. Just confused as usual. It's about the same. Yeah, it, it makes you a little more humble, isn't it? I think a little bit. Yeah, but I don't think this is any different. 
In other words, when you follow over the years all of our assumptions if about paying attention. fluorosis and all of these things, these exactly. are so different now than they were before. And the question something before would have been wrong, right? And now that's the right answer. Sure. Yeah. Low fat diet, right? Is that still on our menu at the hospital, by the way? And last time I checked, it still was, by the way. Not the Mediterranean. Any other thoughts? So we do have an online question. Uh, and the question comes from an anonymous attendee, but the question is, how does the scientific community build the trust back? Well, I, I do think that I, this uh, article uh, gets at it. Part of it is, is we can't change the world, but at least we can change ourselves. And if we do that, I think that's that's all we can do. And I think it, it has to do with being a little bit more professional, a little bit more looking into ourselves, what are our biases? And when we write these letters to the editor, maybe we take out some of those words. And then when we when we talk about new studies, we're a little bit more sober in our assessment. My brother sends me things every day because my mother died of dementia about a new study of dementia. I'm so cynical, I just roll my eyes constantly. But I, I do think we could be a little bit more sober in how we present what we do and a little more humble. And I think, ironically, we'll have more credibility, I think. but. You guys know more. What do you get? Are there thoughts? Are there changes that you are making in terms of how you do reflection at Evan Northwestern General Medicine Associates? Um, it, it's kind of what I told John. It just it sort of reinforces how important the basics are, I guess, is that we. One of the things I thought about this during the whole time is like when you're on a committee at, at a line or, or with my group, whatever it is, if, if you're making a policy decision, you know, what is the evidence supports this decision? What are the trade-offs? And third, when are we going to go back and review what we just did? I, mean, I wish we had done that with our policies. If we're doing this, this is why. And we're going to revisit this in maybe it's two months, three months, but also as two years gone by, we're still scrubbing down the rooms, right? How long did that go on? So that, that, that's one of the three things that I learned is, that, is I wish we, every time we have a meeting, what's the evidence? What's the trade off? And when are you going to revisit it? That's a very well, thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.